I'm a Laka. I am Dagestanian. I am a Chechen, an English, a Russian, a Tatar, a Jew, a Mordvin, an Ossetian. I. History knows many dictators. Their names roll on the tongue like a curse. Nikolai Ceausescu, Joseph Stalin, Kim Yersum, Saddam Hussein, Adolf Hitler, Muammar Gaddafi. Only a few of them managed to live out their lives like Stalin. Others died. They were killed like Gaddafi. They were shot like Ceausescu. Or they committed suicide like Hitler. Among the dictators, there is one who is still alive. His name seems to be cursed by millions of people around the world right now. Vladimir Putin. The president of modern Russia, a war criminal and child abductor. 24 years on the throne and two decades. This is a bloody trail of terrorist attacks, wars, regional conflicts, and the murder of behind-the-scenes conspiracy theories. Russia's border doesn't end anywhere. This is not just a story about Putin. It's about the image of modern Russia. A country that captures, rapes, kills, steals and conducts the most extensive propaganda since World War II. How did a Russian tyrant come to power thanks to prison jargon? How did he turn from a grey intelligence officer into one whose name is known all over the world? Pseudo-history or fictional world? Attempts to desperately hold on to power or multi-million voter support? We, as martyrs, will go to heaven. And they are just going to die. The year is 1994. The first Chechen war began. President of the Russian Federation Boris Yeltsin. Russia is shaky, and so is the ruble. In one day, on the Moscow International Currency Exchange, the exchange rate rose from 2,833 to almost 4,000 rubles per dollar. At a meeting with the then British Prince Charles, a short man in a coat that is several sizes too large frowns. KGB officers, they say, do not exist formally. An ambitious, nervous young man, the future Prime Minister of Russia, 44-year-old Vladimir Putin. At that time, he was still officially the Deputy Mayor of St. Petersburg. Over time, his career will become more rapid. Two years after the meeting with Prince Charles, Putin will be invited to work in Moscow. In 1997, he became Deputy Head of the Presidential Administration of Russia, and then headed the Federal Security Service, FSB. On August 9, 1999, Putin was appointed acting head of the government of the Russian Federation. Today, Boris Yeltsin for the first time officially announced the name of his successor in the presidency. In his television to Russian citizens, the head of state said that the best choice would be to elect Vladimir Putin as the new president of Russia in 2000. Yeltsin's address took place three years after the end of the First Chechen War. Back in 1996, Moscow withdrew its troops from Ichkeria. The Kassaviet agreements led to the cessation of hostilities and the withdrawal of the Russian occupiers from Chechnya. The status of the territory was postponed until 31 December 2001. But for the Chechens, these agreements became a pact with the devil. Did they know then that his name was Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin? There was a rumble, then it was heard, and you can see the ceilings falling in the house. I jumped on the balcony, didn't see anything. This fog is this. Dust. And that's it. September 1999. In Moscow, Volgodonsk and Bynaksk, apartment buildings were blown up, as a result of which 307 Russians were killed and another 1700 were injured. It's hard to call these people people. They can't even be called beasts. If it's beasts, they are demons. The so-called Chechen militants will be blamed for these terrorist attacks. Vladimir Putin, using prison vocabulary, will raise his rating. He will promise to pursue terrorists anywhere. We will chase terrorists everywhere. At the airport? At the airport. Excuse me, we'll catch them in the toilet and soak them in the toilet after all. After the explosions in Moscow and other settlements of Russia, residents of one of the houses in Ryazani found bags of hexogen explosives in the basement, which were brought there by FSB officers. Vladimir Vasilyev, an engineer from Ryazan, was returning home on the night of September 22nd when he noticed three people behaving suspiciously 
suspiciously near his apartment building. He called the police. Upon the arrival of the local police, the girl said that she saw strangers coming out of the basement. Inspector Andrei Chernshov went downstairs and found three bags attached to an improvised detonator. But the then head of the FSB, Nikolai Patrushev, denied in a televised address. Instead, he said that there was only sugar in the bags. It wasn't an explosion. First of all, secondly, unforeseen. And I think that they did not work quite clearly. It was training, there was sugar. There was no explosive device. Authorities refused to investigate the explosions further. At that time, a small group of liberal officials set up their own independent committee. Soon after, however, his vice volley, Sergei Yushchenkov, a consistent critic of the Kremlin, was shot dead. Perhaps the first, but certainly not the last, assassination during the Putin regime. FSB officers rummaging around the Ryazani house were first detained, but later released. The Secret Service came up with a convenient version of the so-called civil defense exercises in Ryazani. All this led to the strengthening of the regime, the omnipotence of the special services and also hatred towards the Chechens. The second war has begun, this time it will be successful for Russia. It was a year when Vladimir Putin was lucky. In 1999, Russia's security service, the FSB, formerly known as the KGB, gave Boris Yeltsin a list of names of those allowed to succeed him as president. He could have elected whoever he wanted as Russia's next president, says Russian historian Yuri Felshtinsky, but all three candidates who were presented to him were from the FSB. As Felshtinsky recounts in his history of the Russian special services, from the Red Terror to the terrorist state, former KGB officer Putin was at the bottom of the list. There was Primakov, who was the former director of the Foreign Intelligence Service. There was Stepashin, who was the former director of the Federal Grid Company, another incarnation of the FSB before the name change. And then there was Putin, he tells ABC. In 1999, Yeltsin was completing his second presidential term. The constitution, before Putin changed it, prohibited him from running for a third time. Yevgeny Primakov, a former journalist, was very interested in foreign affairs but was dismissive of the president of the Russian Federation. Therefore, Primakov was removed from the list. Like FSB number two candidate Sergei Stipishin, he was seen by the security services as one who could compromise with his competitors and enemies. On the list that Yeltsin allegedly received, there was only one left. Vladimir Putin, who already had a career from service in Dresden to director of the FSB in 1998. But enough about Putin. After all, it's a pretty random figure. If there had been no Putin, Pupkin would have been found. What is important is Putinism, that is, the set of means that the authorities use to reproduce themselves. Putinism is the highest and final stage of gangster capitalism in Russia. The stage at which, as one forgotten classic said, the bourgeoisie throws overboard the banner of democratic freedoms and human rights. Putin's popularity against the backdrop of the persecution of alleged Chechen terrorists has only begun to grow. Six months later, Putin won the presidential election with nearly twice as many votes as his closest rival. Russian television is broadcasting live the inauguration ceremony of the elected president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. The broadcast is conducted by all federal TV channels, radio stations of the country. The ceremony takes place in the Grand Kremlin Palace. From then on, Putin will politically leave the Kremlin only to create the appearance of democracy. In 24 years, a number of faces will change in Russia, new ministers, heads of departments, living oppositionists in place of those liquidated, and he will stay. And it will continue to wage wars. Seize power? Russian President Vladimir Putin easily earned himself political points from the population. At the beginning of the 21st century, he literally ran an economy that was developing after a long recession in the 1990s. His decisions have already hinted at the restriction of freedom of speech, the creation of a dictatorship and the course towards the militarization of the population. Blinded by the so-called economic successes, the Russians stubbornly ignored. Putin took full control of 89 regions and republics of Russia, dividing them into seven new federal districts. Each of them was headed by a representative appointed by the president. He also deprived regional governors of the right to sit in the Federation Council. In 2002, Putin announced the end of the military campaign in Chechnya, and casualties were high. 
However, Ichkiria lost its independence and gained the trauma of the nation. Anyone suspected of belonging to Chechen detachments or belonging to the same family as the partisans was sent to filtration camps. They come up with all sorts of the most sophisticated and unknown tortures that are even unimaginable. The human mind can't even comprehend it. They are beaten, suspended, electric current is passed through people. In the last war, one of the militants who ended up in this filtration camp, by the way, described how they were forbidden to relieve their physiological needs, forcibly interrupting them and driving them away. But these are just horrible things. The Russians did to Grozny what they would do to a number of Ukrainian cities 20 years later, they demolished them from the face of the earth. And then Putin was re-elected for the second time, in March 2004. I promise you that all the democratic gains of our people will be unconditionally secured and guaranteed. Of course, it was not without the elimination of competitors. Medusa describes the campaign story of the former secretary of the Security Council of the Russian Federation, Ivan Rybkin, who ran for the Russian presidential election in 2004. On February 5, about a month before the date of the vote, Rybkin disappeared from Moscow. His wife went to the police. Five days later, he found himself in Kiev and at first could not explain why he was there. Then Ivan Rybkin said that he was lured to Ukraine, poisoned, made a compromising video and promised to publish if the politician did not withdraw his candidacy. On March 5, 2004, Rybkin announced his refusal to participate in the elections. In the December 2007 parliamentary races, Putin's United Russia Party won a majority of seats. Although international observers and the Communist Party of the Russian Federation questioned the integrity of the election, the results did confirm Putin's power. And it is during this period that Russia begins to increase its propaganda about Ukraine, long before the annexation of Crimea, long before the Great War. In 2005, during his address to the nation, Putin called the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, and this was gladly picked up by the Kremlin's mouthpieces. During the two months of the election campaign, the main state channels of Russia did everything they could for the candidate Yanukovych. They exquisitely mocked Shushchenko, showed his face in close-up. When Putin found himself in a campaign with Lukas Henka and Milosevic, he congratulated Yanukovych. The names of Schroeder, Bush and other friends of Putin, who claimed that the elections were rigged, did not drop the lips of the hosts. The constitution was still working a bit, at least for everyone's sake, so Putin stepped down after his second term in 2008. He chose Dmitry Medvedev as his successor. A tame prime minister becomes a tame president. I would like to sincerely thank everyone who trusts me, everyone who is sitting here in the hall, and those who look at us and, in general, everyone who voted for me in the presidential election, and, as a result, based on the fact that we are pursuing a very necessary course for the country. This course involved the seizure of new territories, underground games of politics, cooperation with oligarchs, and restrictions on freedom of speech. All was replaced by SOAP. Medvedev nominated the ex-president for prime minister just hours after taking office. Putin was still the main force in the Kremlin. The year 2008 will be positive for the Russian aggressors. Western leaders will show the Kremlin. The seizure of surrounding lands is possible. Come, take, steal, lie, kill the unwanted. To seize other people's lands? April 2008. Dmitry Medvedev has been president for a month. Russia is shrouded in propaganda and narratives about rising from your knees. Putin and the security services continue to rule the country. In recent years, the political technologists of power together appealed to some basic instincts before the elections. 1996, artificially instilled fear of the return of communists. 1999, fear of terrorism and the immortal kill in the toilet. In 2003, oligarchs of a certain nationality robbed the people. That's why you have to raise the stakes every time. Now we are threatened not just by Chechen terrorists and Jewish oligarchs, but by the West standing behind them. The United States is the backstage of the world, trying to deprive Russia of its sovereignty, dissolve it and destroy it. The front runs through every street, every house, every toilet.
On April 4, 2008, the NATO summit ended in Bucharest. At the meetings, they talked about the prospects for expansion. Germany and France did not want to spoil relations with Russia, so Georgia and Ukraine were refused. When Putin flew to Bucharest in the afternoon, because there was a part of the summit dedicated to NATO-Russia relations, and when Putin said at that part of the summit that Ukraine is an artificial entity, Russia gave up the lands in eastern Ukraine, the Poles in the west, absolutely brutally, brazenly, with disrespect. What should we do then? That's when we will have to retarget our missiles at targets that we believe threaten our national security. Therefore, the decision on Ukraine's accession to the alliance was postponed until December, but in fact it was put on the back burner. They did not admit Georgia to the Union either. They promised an open door, but without an action plan. This is a strategic mistake with serious geopolitical consequences. At that time, it was necessary to move forward, to approve the accession of these two countries to NATO. This policy of indoctrination has failed. At the Bucharest summit, Russia actually received the right to veto the expansion of the alliance to the east. Putin regarded the refusal to provide a membership action plan as permission to start a war. Cut launch to conquer those territories that were not covered by NATO enlargement. The then German Chancellor would tell ex-President Viktor Yushchenko. The level of Ukrainian support for integration into NATO was 31%. It's not enough. The beginning of the Russian-Ukrainian war six years after the summit will show that even if public support increases, it is still not enough. It was during the 2000s that Angela Merkel put Europe on the Kremlin's gas needle. Nord Stream 1, diplomatic meetings with the Russian dictator, who kept his population in an iron vice, business relations between German officials and Russians. Gazprom and its German partners produced natural gas at a field in the Yamala Nenets Autonomous Okrug. At this time, in the countries of Eastern Europe, as well as in London and Washington, they are talking about the EU's dangerous dependence on Russian energy resources. This outrages Putin. Angela Merkel, on the other hand, calls Russia a partner that will only strengthen political stability in Europe. If Moscow is allowed into the European economy, this large delegation testifies to the importance of our relations with Russia. The Russian economy is steadily modernizing, and I think we are very interested in that, the Chancellor told reporters in April 2006. Vladimir Putin pretends to be on good terms with the German Chancellor, but he always reminds the German woman who is in charge. At one of the meetings, he will let his dog go, although he knows very well how afraid Angela Merkel is of dogs. A smiling dictator, a frightened, embarrassed German politician, perhaps a symbol of Russian-German relations, which will be broken only in 2022. Just as there was the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, of which we are well aware, there was also a de facto Merkel-Putin gas and energy pact. But not by Germany alone. Then French President Nicolas Sarkozy met with Putin on several occasions. He also did not support Ukraine's accession to NATO. And this even surprised the other allies a little. The parade of bending under the Russian dictator in April 2008 was also described by the Prime Minister of Slovenia, Jens Jane. According to him, the accession of Ukraine and Georgia was opposed by the Russian Federation, which, of course, did not have the right of veto, but had the support of Germany and France. U.S. President Bush commented that he does not think it is logical for some European NATO members to take a position against enlargement when it ultimately brings additional security, in particular to the European wing of the alliance. Bush, according to Janch, hoped that Condoleezza Rice would be able to persuade Merkel and Sarkozy. Poland and the Baltic states have warned not to succumb to Putin's plan, Janch writes. The US was with us, but Germany and France insisted on not making this decision. Peaceful Western Europe felt no remorse. The conflicts that broke out in the world required only peacekeeping missions and political concern. No one mentioned the Second Chechen War to Putin. No one pointed out to him the terrorist attacks, which were almost certainly behind the FSB. Gas was cheap, relations were strong, and then Russia invaded Georgia. Georgia has committed aggression against South Ossetia. This is how the military conflict of 2008 was again assessed today by Russian President Vladimir Putin.
For months after the notorious NATO summit in 2008, Russian troops entered Georgian lands. It all started in August on the territory of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. The Georgian and Ossetian villages that make up South Ossetia have been mired in inter-ethnic killings and intimidation. Many Georgians saw ethnic Ossetians as a treacherous fifth column, while their country fought for freedom from Russia. On August 8, 2008, South Ossetian separatists began to actively shell Georgian villages, so the Georgian military returned fire. In Tbilisi, the restoration of constitutional order was announced, and on the morning of August 8, the Georgian army occupied most of Skinvali, the main settlement of South Ossetia. Russian forces immediately intervened in this internal conflict and responded by bombing Georgian cities, military bases and civilian infrastructure, as well as using their naval forces. With a manpower advantage of 85,000 Russians against 28,000 Georgian troops, in the next few days the Russian army pushed Georgian forces out of northern Ossetia and invaded Georgia, wedging itself into the Kodori Gorge. The Marines of the Black Sea Fleet occupied the main port of Georgia Poti and destroyed all Georgian boats and ships of military importance, including border guard vessels. Pro-Russian separatists from Abkhazia acted as a separate front. On August 10, Tbilisi announced the withdrawal of troops from Skvali and a unilateral ceasefire. And on August 12, President Saakashvili signed a truce plan proposed by the European Union, the main points of which were a final ceasefire and the return of troops to their bases by the parties to the the conflict. Russian troops continued to actively advance deep into Georgian territory. The invaders occupied the cities of Gori and Sanaki, cut the strategic road of western and eastern Georgia. On August 26, the Kremlin declared the so-called independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. The Russian invaders still advanced deep into Georgian territory and reached Tbilisi. But they failed to capture the capital, including for political reasons. There was a very interesting situation there. They could not find the Golada. Anyone. Even those politicians who fled to Russia when they were offered to head such an administration replied, you don't know Georgian society well, it won't accept it. Fortunately, this is the situation here, fortunately for Georgia. The confrontations lasted only five days. The world stood, watched, and was ambivalent about the Russian invasion of Georgia. The invaders will control South Ossetia and Abkhazia for many years to come. Then the Prime Minister, and now the President of Russia, commented on the threats that the aggressor state will bring to the world in the near future. Many post-Soviet countries, including Ukraine, are concerned about Russia's brutal measures against Georgia. They, he said, asked the same question, can you guarantee that such actions will never happen in relation to other states? I object to the wording of this question. We can't guarantee that we will attack someone. We didn't attack anyone. It is we who demand guarantees from others so that no one will attack us anymore and no one will kill our citizens. They are trying to provoke us. During the Russian campaign in Georgia, he will deny the future occupation of Ukrainian territories. Russia has long recognized the borders of today's Ukraine. We, in fact, have finished in general and in general our negotiations on the border. And six years after the Georgian war, he will loot Crimea and wage a brutal hybrid war in Ukraine. Eliminate the enemies of the country. When you're in the Caucasus, the most important thing is connections. They are not easily established. They cost neither money nor anything similar. It's only your personal contact with a person, your personal trust. A bloody gift for the dictator's birthday is the murder of Russian journalist Anna Politkovskaya. He turned 54, she was forever 48. Anna Politkovskaya was a special correspondent for Novaya Gazeta. She started working in the media in 1999. For her, the topic of the Second Chechen War began with the topic of refugees, and then trips to the front, and criticism of Putin, in particular because of the so-called terrorist attacks with the explosion of high-rise buildings in Russia. The journalist investigated the brutality and criminality of the Russian military in Chechnya. She has written about torture, mass executions, abductions, and the sale of Chechen corpses by Russian soldiers to their families for proper Islamic burial. 
Russian media claimed pressure from Vladimir Putin. But Anna Politkovskaya resisted the regime and continued to cover its bloody activities. For this, she was repeatedly threatened, intimidated, and horrified with murder. On October 7, 2006, Anna Politkovskaya was shot dead. In the afternoon, a neighbor found a lifeless body in the entrance of the house where the journalist lived. Subsequently, the so-called investigation ruled. An unknown person in dark clothes first shot her three times at close range, hitting her twice in the chest and once in the shoulder, after which he fired a control shot to the head. In the elevator of a high-rise building, they found a Makarov pistol and its spent shell casings. Politkovskaya's colleagues, friends and international press freedom groups said she was killed to silence or in retaliation for past articles. On this day, the Russian dictator celebrated his birthday. Anna's relatives and colleagues mourned the journalist who did not remain silent about the crimes and sins of the Putin regime. Mrs. Politkovskaya's desk in the now-closed newspaper stood untouched for 17 years, with her typewriter, her glasses, her notes, and a book whose title seemed to sum up the impunity of the Putin era. A story of an inconclusive investigation. And after the start of the full-scale invasion, the Russian government pardoned Sergei Karchakurba off, who was convicted of the murder of a Russian journalist. He agreed to participate in the war against Ukraine and earned a pardon from the Russian dictator. His lawyer claims that the defendant was immediately offered a command position because of his previous experience of service in the special forces in the 1990s. There is no question of punishment for the real customer of this murder. The Kremlin denies any involvement. The current head of Chechnya, Ramzan Kadyrov, was also silent. Anna Politkovskaya wrote about both of them. In both cases, it was about crimes. My last name is Litvinenko. My name is Alexander. I am a former lieutenant colonel of the Federal Security Service of the Russian Federation. Now I live in England, where I have political asylum. Me and my family. And this is Alexander Litvinenko. A year before Putin became president for the first time, the FSB officer openly said that he and his colleagues had ordered businessman and politician Boris Berezovsky. This is a Russian oligarch who is called one of those who brought Putin to power. However, in the 2000s, he emigrated to London and became one of the fiercest critics of Putin's regime. In 2013, after several announced attempts to remove the oligarch, the body of Boris Berezovsky was found in one of the houses in Ascot, UK. According to the official version, he committed suicide. But the circumstances of his death are still a mystery. The Kremlin's pressure on Litvinenko was not long in coming. A number of criminal cases prompted him and his family to seek political asylum in the UK. There, he cooperated with local and Spanish intelligence, merged FSB officers and fought the Russian mafia in Europe. He managed to live in the country without a regime for less than five years. Literally in November 2006, he burned to death in the hospital. Litvinenko will have a dysfunction of the bone marrow, which will not produce enough leukocytes to support the body's immune system. Only an autopsy will soon show that this is poisoning with polonium-210, a radioactive substance. It is a metal found in uranium ore. Its isotope 210 is highly radioactive, since it emits positively charged alpha particles. If it is outside the human body, it does not pose a great danger, since alpha particles move no more than a few centimeters and cannot penetrate the skin. However, if it gets inside, even in the smallest amount, it damages the internal organs so much that they stop working and death is inevitable. Polonium-210 for a former Special Forces soldier will be mixed into tea by an ex-colleague from the FSB, Andrei Lugovoy. Litvinenko will notice something wrong only when he returns home. He will be taken to the hospital with suspected food poisoning. The chances of survival will be 50 50 and Alexander will fight for his life for more than 20 days. And then he will die, and the world will suspect the Russian dictator of murder. Only nine years after Litvinenko's death, 
All the evidence points in one direction, namely that in the murder of Mr. Litvinenko they acted on someone's instructions. I have come to the conclusion that there is a high probability that Mr. Lugovoy poisoned Mr. Litvinenko on the instructions of the FSB. Federal Security Service of the Russian Federation. I also came to the further conclusion that Mr. Kovtun was also acting on instructions from the FSB, perhaps not directly, but through Mr. Lugovoy. But, apparently, knowing that there is an organization whose instructions he follows, then I understood that the FSB operation to organize the murder of Mr. Litvinenko was apparently approved by Mr. Patrushev, who was then head of the FSB, as well as by President Putin. Vladimir Putin would vote for Yanukovych. The asterisk, 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 Vladimir Putin, just so you understand. And this is Boris Nemtsov, a Russian oppositionist and critic of Putin. He supported the Orange Revolution in Kiev, and after the start of the war, he condemned the occupation of Crimea. There are three possible scenarios for a revolution in Russia, and according to the degree of opportunity, they are distributed as follows. In the first place is the nationalist scenario. It will be a revolution with pogroms of other peoples. In second place is the scenario socialist or communist. It will be a revolution caused by the dissatisfaction of the people, the decline in living standards, the lack of social mobility, the growth of corruption and embezzlement, social stratification and hatred of the oligarchs. And finally, in third place, in terms of the degree of possibility, is the liberal revolution caused by the lack of freedom and democracy. In any case, revolution is blood. Putin bears 100% responsibility for the revolutionary scenario, clings to power with his claws and pursues a policy of embezzlement and fraud. Not a single revolution against the current government has taken place. But at the peak of his political career, Boris Nemtsov will predict what Putin's terrible future will look like. Inside the country, there will be an increase in reaction, xenophobia, that is, hatred towards all other citizens of the planet, and authoritarian dictatorial tendencies will intensify. It's obvious. Politically, it is the strengthening of dictatorship and authoritarian tendencies. In business terms, this is a restriction for Russian companies. And in terms of international tensions, it's an arms race. On March 1, 2015, the Russian opposition will plan a peaceful march, spring. Boris Nemtsov will not take part in the rally. On February 27, at 11.40 p.m., an unknown person killed him with four shots to the chest, head and heart. Instant death on the eve of the release of a report titled, Putin and the War. Nemtsov was going to demonstrate evidence of the participation of the Russian army in the war in Donbass and Putin's involvement. The mass deaths of Russian soldiers were associated with the escalation of the conflict and confrontation, in particular, near the city of Dibaltsev. Unlike last year, this time Russian soldiers were officially discharged from the military forces at the request of their superiors before being sent to Donbass. In this way, it was planned to conceal the participation of our army in the battles by presenting the military as volunteers. A few people and fingers on their limbs will not be enough to count the number of deaths that Putin has ordered. Governor of the Magadan region Valentin Svetkov. He was shot in the head for fighting criminal gangs in the Far East. Journalist and writer, State Duma Deputy Yuri Shikotakin. He investigated the 1999 bombings and died after a so-called mysterious illness that was probably caused by Thalius. The editor-in-chief of the Russian version of Forbes magazine is American journalist Paul Klebnikov. He was shot dead under the media building. He investigated corruption in the Kremlin. Russian terrorist Yevgeny Prigozhin, who was eliminated in flight in August 2023 for starting a rebellion against Moscow and for finding the strength to speak out against Putin's clique and dozens more who could not be killed the first time. Ex-employee of Russian military intelligence Sergei Skripal. He and his daughter were poisoned with the nerve agent Novichok. A similar story, however, happened in Russia with opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Also a Novichok, and dozens, hundreds, thousands of other undesirables whom the Russian special services under the leadership of Vladimir Putin tried to kill. 
In order to stay on the throne for a long time, Putin needed money. And he found them among the so-called elites who obeyed, supported, or feared the Kremlin. $200 billion as of 2015 alone, according to Bill Browder, head of the Hermitage Capital Investment Fund, formerly the largest foreign investor in Russia. Well, let's say, the first eight to ten years of Putin's rule in Russia were about stealing as much money as possible. And some people, myself included, think he's the richest man in the world, or one of the richest people in the world, with hundreds of billions of dollars stolen from Russia. At this point, it would be appropriate to say that the Russians, your roads, sewers, water supply and schools are in Putin's pocket. But they already know. In 2012, Russian oppositionists Boris Nemtsov and Leonid Martinyuk presented a report entitled The Life of a Slave in the Galleys. And under Putin, corruption has ceased to be a problem, but has become a system. Russian oppositionists claimed that the fleet of aircraft of the Special Flight Detachment, Russia, which serves the president, includes 43 planes and 15 helicopters. Putin also owns a mini flotilla worth $100 million. There are 700 cars in the fleet of the presidential administration, which are used by the president and his escort. Putin has a collection of watches worth 22 million rubles. For comparison, the president of the the United States has two residences, the head of Germany has the same number, the head of Italy has three. It should be noted that nine palaces appeared during Putin's reign. Thus, the already obscenely large number of residences under Putin has almost doubled, the report says. In January 2021, Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, then still alive and not behind bars, published an investigation about a palace for Putin. There, this property was called the most secret protected object in Russia. Not a country house, not a summer cottage, not a residence, it's a whole city, but rather, a kingdom, impregnable fences, its own port, its own security church, its own access regime, a no-fly zone, its own casino, an amphitheater and even a border checkpoint. It's just a separate state within Russia. And in this state there is a single and unchanging Tsar, Putin. If you look inside, you will realize that the president of Russia is mentally unhealthy. Imagine the principality of Monaco. It is a small, but still a separate country. And here is a possession with the size of 39 principalities of Monaco. It is built in such a way that it cannot be approached by land, sea, or air. These are all offshore accounts, money stolen from Russia, financial schemes and Putin's friends, oligarchs. Despite the expectations of the international community, they are still helping the Russian dictator to wage war. Among his entourage are billionaires, owners of huge enterprises, non-public figures and old colleagues. Yuri Kovalchuk is an oligarch and Putin's personal banker. Both the Russian dictator and his ally own houses in the exclusive Ozero Dacha cooperative. It was Kovalchuk who arranged the wedding of Putin's daughter in 2013, and it is he who is called the de facto second man in Russia. Oleg Deripaska is a Russian businessman, billionaire, founder of the aluminum company Rusal. In 2008, he was named the richest citizen of Russia and ninth in the world ranking by Forbes magazine. The security service of Ukraine suspects Oleg Deripaska of organizing the seizure of the Zaporizhia aluminum production plant, as well as legalizing these funds by acquiring the rights to the Lukov quartzite quarry and organizing the financing of Russian aggression. Leonid Mikkelsen is a Russian entrepreneur, chairman of the board and a major shareholder of the Russian gas company PAO Novatek. Despite U.S. sanctions, its subsidiary Yamal SBG has stepped up efforts to exploit Arctic resources and lobby for Russian interests in France. The oligarchs who did not support Putin got a lot of problems instead of a lot of money. Those Russian big businessmen who thought it was possible to play by their own rules have long lost the duel with the Kremlin. Boris Berezovsky was forced to emigrate, and later he died under circumstances that are still unclear. Vladimir Gasinsky was also expelled from the country, forced to give up his own TV holding, and now he is one of the main propaganda mouthpieces of the Russian government.
Российской влады. Михаил Кодаковский был изпрессован в многие годы, и его компания ЮКОС была уничтожена для того, чтобы создать государственный фонд для одного из Путина's closest associates, Игор Сечин. Для одного из ближайших соратников Путина, Игоря Сечина. Putin is not only about foul political play, contract killings, and unleashed wars. It's also about huge amounts of corruption. He steals millions of rubles and billions of dollars from Russians. But they continue to be silent and admire the Tsar. Everyone is united by one secret, domination in the Kremlin. Vladimir Putin makes friends not only among the oligarchs, but also among the loyal dogs of the regime. They have been on the agenda of the Russian dictator for a long time, so let's talk about them as well. Vladimir Putin's long table will soon become a meme on social media. But at the time of the photo, they will be sitting behind him, Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu and Chief of the General Staff Valery Gerasimov. Both are confidants of the Russian president. Shoigu! Gerasimov, where the FK is my MO. With these words, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner terrorist group, will address these figures during his lifetime. And this is perhaps the most famous mention of the Russian minister and chief of the Russian general staff over the past few years. It is Sergei Shoigu who is credited with the seizure of the Crimean Peninsula in 2014. It was he who was supposed to capture Kiev in a few days during Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Sergei Shoigu's political career began in 1995. At the end of 2001, he became co-chairman of the United Russia Party. Then there were the elections in 2003 and 2007, and then a career in emergency and defense services. At first, he was the head of the Ministry of Emergency Situations of Russia, and in 2012 he was appointed Minister of Defense by Putin's decree. Here, of course, everything is in the favorite traditions of the Russian dictator, complete obedience, affection and, of course, corruption. Нацагентство по вопросам предотвращения коррупции Украины отправило письмо министру обороны России Сергею Шуйгу. В письме отмечается, что российский чиновник внес неоценимый вклад в то, что российские средства и ресурсы для нападения на Украину были разворованы еще на этапе их накопления. О коррупции в российской армии говорили не раз, однако в своей стране Шуйгу пользуется большой популярностью. А на его родине, в самой отдаленной и загадочной республике Тыве, и вовсе настоящий культ имени Шуйгу. He is a native of the Republic of Tyva or Tuva. The poverty rate here is the highest in Russia, more than 40% of the region's inhabitants are beggars. Nevertheless, Sergei Шуйгу does not think about his historical homeland as much as about the war in Ukraine. Plundering the new through destruction, this is the idea behind the political and military doctrine of the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation. At the same time, he sometimes looks ugly, often confused and pales in comparison with other Russian bureaucrats. The same cannot be said about Valery Gerasimov. It is this general who is credited with organizing the war in Donbass by the Russian army. Gerasimov personally made a decision to unleash and wage an aggressive war and a military conflict on the territory of the sovereign state of Ukraine. He is one of the few in Russia who has a good understanding of the nature of hybrid warfare. When conventional confrontation is only part of a larger campaign, the important aspects of which are information confrontation, internal opposition, a number of important operations and proper long-term planning of the conflict. Wars are no longer declared, and once they have begun, they do not follow the pattern we are used to. Frontal clashes between large groups, troops, and forces at the strategic and operational levels are gradually becoming a thing of the past. Remote non-contact action on the enemy becomes the main way to achieve the goals of the battle and operation. Destruction of its objects is carried out to the entire depth of the territory. The differences between the strategic, operational and tactical levels, offensive and defensive actions are being erased. The Kremlin has been using all of Gerasimov's scientific research in the war against Ukraine since 2014. In the context of the hybrid confrontation, units of the regular army, militant units, economic sanctions, energy embargo, political destabilization, information warfare, financial pressure and cyber attacks were used.
Next in line is Nikolai Patrushev, a loyal ally of Putin, former head of the FSB, and now Secretary of the Federal Security Council. Patrushev is the most bellicose fork of Putin's entourage. He is sure that the West has been dreaming of destroying Russia for years, says Ben Noble, an associate professor at University College London who specializes in Russian politics. He is one of three of Putin's associates who have served with him since the 1970s in St. Petersburg, then Leningrad. Few people have as much influence on the president as Nikolai Patrushev. Nikolai Patrushev passed the test. He has the loudest battle cry and there is a feeling that it was he who pushed Putin to radical action, says Ben Noble. Other friends of the Kremlin include longtime FSB chief Alexander Bortnikov, Foreign Intelligence Director Sergei Narishkin, and Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Their age says more than direct quotes. They are constant, old in every sense of the word, friends of Vladimir Putin. They are the ones who help him wage war against Ukraine. It is they who are responsible for having tens of thousands of victims in the confrontation between good and evil, where these faces definitely do not appear in the hypostasis of light. Crimea and Sevastopol are returning to their native harbor. With these words, the Russian dictator announces the occupation of the Crimean Peninsula. This is a difficult, perhaps the most difficult period for Ukraine. Euromaidan, which was supposed to be the end of the European integration mood of Ukrainians, in fact marked only the beginning of the struggle for freedom, not only from the pro-Russian President Yanukovych and his clique, but from those who sat in the Kremlin and dreamed of seizing all of Ukraine. Із 1 по 16 березня російськими військовими і парамілітарними формуваннями Кримська самооборона були захоплені основні військові об'єкти та адміністративні будівлі Криму, а кількість російських військових зросла до 20 тисяч військовослужбовців. Водночас окремі підрозділи Збройних сил України стійко тримали оборону і залишили півострів тільки після отримання відповідного наказу 26 березня 2014 року. 16 березня на території Криму і Севастополя відбувся референдум про відновлення Конституції Криму 92-го року і про входження півострову до складу Росії, який не визнаний більшістю країн світу через недотримання жодних загально визнаних стандартів народовиявлення. 18 березня Путін оголосив про приєднання Криму до Росії. Western countries have recognized the occupation and annexation of Crimea as illegal and imposed economic sanctions. In eastern Ukraine, meanwhile, Russia has been testing all methods of hybrid warfare. The creation of the so-called quasi-republics, which were planned long before the war in eastern Ukraine. The narrative of the so-called civil war and the propaganda thesis, we are not there. We are Russia, we cannot talk about any conditions for a ceasefire, about possible agreements between Kiev, Donetsk, Luhansk. These are not our business, these are the internal affairs of Ukraine. We can only contribute to creating a situation of trust. Subsequently, separatists and occupiers from the hands of the Kremlin held illegal referendums on May 11, 2014. Someone, under the pressure of Russian propaganda and genetic inability to assess threats, voted for the so-called independence from Kiev. Someone was killed, like Donetsk activist Dmitry Chernyavsky. He was forced to leave his home because of the occupation. The elections seem to have taken place. And there were elections there. People came and voted. And this, in my opinion, is a democratic way of organizing the authorities. Ukraine was recovering from the revolution of dignity, mourning the heavenly hundred, and thousands of volunteers went to defend their land in the war, which was then called the anti-terrorist operation. Then the battles for Ilovaisk in August 2014. Deceptive approval of the Russian military and local militants for a humanitarian corridor for Ukrainian forces. Open fire from the invaders, as a result of hundreds of casualties among the Ukrainian military, Debortsev salient and the operation to withdraw Ukrainian forces, with losses, because of the war, the battles for the Donetsk airport, which lasted from September 2014 to January 23, 2015, became one of the fiercest stages in the initial stage of the Russian-Ukrainian war. Then Ukraine surprised the whole world and showed the dictator its teeth.
They failed to implement the Donetsk scenario in Kharkiv and easily advanced through the eastern regions of Ukraine. And also the recapture of Mariupol in June 2014, the liberation of Sloviansk in July of the same year. Back then, Russia planned to absorb part of Ukraine, but thanks to volunteers, it did not succeed. Crimea, meanwhile, has become a significant part of Russian propaganda and the Kremlin's so-called red lines. The world will understand that they mean nothing only in the fall of 2022, when the symbol of Vladimir Putin's immense power, the Kerch Bridge, will burn for the first time. A new army for Ukraine, a new aspiration for NATO, this time in the Constitution, the path to European democracy and transparency, and the Minsk agreements were the bruxism of Ukrainian politicians of that time. After all, the so-called reconciliation will be pushed not only by Russia, but also by Western countries. They will talk about resolving the conflict and express fierce concern about Russia's actions, but they will not help with weapons, advice and financial support. Under the pressure of circumstances, Ukraine was forced to sign these political agreements. The Minsk agreements are not an international treaty in the full sense of the word. And these are, in a way, formalized political agreements. Russia, of course, was not going to implement the Minsk agreements. For the Kremlin, it is an element of the game aimed at persuading the West to lift sanctions. The documents of the three editions contained an immediate ceasefire, the withdrawal of heavy weapons, the beginning of a dialogue on local elections in the Ordlo, pardon and amnesty for militants, the exchange of prisoners, the restoration of control over the border, the withdrawal of foreign troops and equipment from Donbass, and the granting of a special status to certain regions through the constitution of Ukraine. The biggest disputes over the full implementation of the Minsk agreements are related to paragraph 9, on the restoration of control over the border with the Russian Federation in the Luhansk and Donetsk regions. It was said that Ukraine would gain control immediately after the elections in the occupied territories. But this would mean that the elections themselves were held under the control of a self-defeated government, controlled by the Russian Federation. Agreements in the so-called Normandy format were signed in Minsk. The Belarusian dictator, meanwhile, tried to pretend to be a peacemaker and called on the parties to come to an understanding. One one of the participants in the negotiations was German Chancellor Angela Merkel. It will call for reconciliation as soon as possible, to reach an understanding with the Russian dictator as soon as possible for the country, which the Kremlin tried to both plunder and undermine from within. The Western world called the attempt to force Ukraine to make peace with the aggressor the task of the transatlantic partnership. One of these tasks is our relations with Russia. When it comes to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, we haven't really made any progress in recent years. The Minsk process is a diplomatic tool that can be used, but it has not been successful. Russia has repeatedly caused a hybrid conflict. Russia has repeatedly violated the Minsk agreements. These are the shelling of Ukrainian positions, attempts to go beyond the delineated territories, constant pressure and systematic propaganda on Western countries. The story of the so-called reconciliation from the world dragged on for eight years. And then, and then we know. The plan of the bloody dictator, which could not be implemented thanks to the Ukrainian defense forces. Capture the entire territory. I have decided to conduct a special military operation. Its goal is to protect people who have been subjected to crimes and genocide by the Kiev regime for eight years. And for this, we will strive for the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. On February 24, 2022, the former FSB officer, multiple president of the Russian Federation, will start a full-scale war against Ukraine. No one will have doubts or artificial concerns anymore. The Kremlin's real plan is to seize and destroy all of Ukraine and all Ukrainians. It doesn't matter if you have a passport, a language, a culture, or a soul, the Russian military will steal, rape, and destroy everything Ukrainian to the ground. Sometimes Russians, Ukrainians and citizens of other countries have questions. And what if Putin had not been elected president for a second, third, or fourth time? And what if the Russians understood the threats from the Russian dictator in time? And what if the next flight of the Kremlin killer ended in a crush? And what if Yevgeny Prigozhin's campaign became successful? And what if, 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 these dreams are like a parallel reality, where good easily wins over evil, 
where good does not have to fight for freedom with blood and sweat. But, one, but, history does not know the word if. Afterward. Well, I can say right away that the Putin they love there will be cursed by descendants and history, just like his prototype, Nicholas I, whom he is trying to be like. I don't know if we will end up with the Crimean War, which we will lose. In general, we have already lost all our wars, both Chechen and Georgian. And I must say that if we have descendants who can curse Putin, it is still good. It is possible that Putin's efforts will simply not have any descendants in this territory.